Okay, sorry for the delay. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Jalais Raymond. Come on. Got it there. Uh, he's the Benjamin Goldberg Professor, and as of just a few weeks ago, now the head of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics at the University of Illinois College of Medicine, which is up in Chicago. Now, one of the few silver linings to COVID is that last year, I was able to watch him just give a local departmental seminar, um, even though I'm 150 miles downstate at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Now, the research in his lab focuses on inflammation in immune, immune response to pathogens, which took on extreme importance after the onset of COVID. His lab has also produced uh, a couple R packages to infer the activity of transcription factors using single cell RNA-seq data by leveraging chip-seq data, and also to do uh, cellular heterogeneity across time. And they're going to be presenting a package demo today at 3.30 in the JMB Sound Garden if you want to check out their packages. I will now turn it over to Dr. Rahman to present his keynote on assessing cellular heterogeneity across time and disease. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for the kind introduction and also um, to the whole Bioconductor team. Um, I think uh, it's just wonderful to have this conference in person, and, and even with the hybrid, it allows people who can't make it here to still participate. So it's been a really fun few days, and, and I look forward to the re remainder of the sessions. So as Jenny already mentioned, um, my lab comes from a biological perspective um, and disease perspective, and roughly five to seven years ago, we started developing computational approaches to study uh, tissue injury, tissue inflammation, and I'll just give you the, the biological background so that you, you understand what got us so excited about using computational approaches. And this is something, um, you know, this is our, our interest predates COVID by quite some time. Uh, but I think it's of value when you try to, um, in the era of COVID, to understand what is it that makes COVID so devastating. What happens in severe COVID-19 is this here is an alveolus of the lung. It fills up with fluid. And that's the reason why people need a ventilator, because they can't breathe. And the reason it fills up with fluid is because these are the blood vessels that go through the lung, the capillaries. They start leaking because the blood vessels here, the lining of the blood vessels, the so-called endothelial cells, they are destroyed. They get damaged. They get broken down. Um, fluid leaks in. And in addition to fluid, immune cells get in there. And the immune cells cause massive inflammation, starting a vicious cycle of inflammation, destruction of more tissue, more leakage. So it's often not the virus that kills people, but it's the destruction and the hyperactivation of the immune system in the lung that does it, even long after the virus is gone. So we started this research before COVID-19. So at that time, our models were bacterial pneumonia, bacterial injury, which is just as devastating. And this is an example of an animal model here. You can see uh, this is a transgenic mouse, red fluorescent tagged is the non-vascular parts of the lung. So these big holes is where our lungs breathe. And they're all covered by blood vessels because that's how our lung exchanges oxygen. So every part of the lung is coated by green fluorescent protein labeling the blood vessels. So red and green go hand in hand together. This is the baseline conditions. This is how a healthy mouse lung and human lung would look. So they're nicely opposed to each other. If you inject a bacterial toxin called LPS into the bloodstream, it hits first the blood vessels of the lung because it's injected into the bloodstream. So the blood vessels get eviscerated. So all this nice green structure here is destroyed. The green fluorescent cells have disappeared. You still have the red fluorescent cells, which are the epithelial cells that are on the air interface, but the blood interface is gone. And then after three days, um, in humans and mice that are fortunate enough to survive, the green cells start regenerating. They grow back. And this is not quite back to baseline, but you can see here that a lot of the green had been restored because our blood vessels in the lung have the ability to grow back. So this is something that we had found you know, about three, four years ago when we were studying bacterial injury, uh, just about before the COVID-19 pandemic. But at the same time, we asked this question, what is it that drives the regeneration here in the green cells? And what drives the injury in the first place? And to a surprise in this eLife paper that you can uh, look up, uh, what we found is that when we compared the blood vessels of the lung, the brain, and the heart, using that same injection of the bacterial toxin into the bloodstream, it was the lung that had the strongest inflammatory response. So the blood vessels of the lung activated all these genes 
involved in immune host defense, immune cell activation, leukocyte proliferation, much more than the brain and much more than the blood vessels of the heart. And so we asked ourselves, why would this make sense? Why would our lungs, this is during homeostasis, so there's no injection at this point. So even during baseline, our lungs are prepped to have a massive immune response, an inflammation response. So we thought, well, maybe that's how we evolved, because our lungs are the one organ which are continuously in contact with the outside world. We're always breathing in pathogens long before COVID. So it makes sense that the lung blood vessels are primed to activate the immune system. But that comes at a cost, because maybe that being primed is what makes our lungs so vulnerable. When we do get hit with a severe infection, they tend to overreact, whereas our brain and our heart blood vessels don't react so strongly. So this is the biological context that prompted a lot of our research. And we said, well, do all blood vessels, blood vessel endothelial cells in the lung have that response? Or are there subpopulations? Which is why we looked into single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, this project was led by Lucy Zhang, who's now an assistant professor at University of Pittsburgh. She's moved on and has her own lab. And Shang Gao, who's actually one of the workshop leaders today. He's a PhD student, about to graduate. And um, we just studied, we injected the uh, lungs of mice, which had a red fluorescent tag in the endothelium, and it just harvested the tissue, three hours, six hours, 12 hours, and so on. At seven days is when their lung fully regenerates in the surviving mice. And we tried to use a non-lethal dose of this bacterial toxin, LPS. So single cell RNA sequencing, this is something that obviously all of you are familiar with. Just a UMAP plot here. This is baseline. So even at baseline, what we found is that there are two predominant clusters in the mouse lung endothelium, one which, without any injury, has an immune response antigen presentation signature, suggestive of this idea that we had that the lung is primed to respond. It's just waiting to be attacked by pathogens in the air. That's our hypothesis, but I think it, it makes sense. Uh, and the other interesting thing is that there's another set of endothelial cells here which are ready to regrow, regenerate, once the injury occurs. So even during the resting state, they have more of a developmental signature. And this is just heat map showing some of those genes that are characteristic. And you find that these histocompatibility complex genes are expressed in that subset of endothelial cells here that are primed for that immune response. And then more developmental genes like SOX17. This is a transcription factor very important during development, or HES1. Um, and they're during the baseline homeostatic state in the lung, they're already being expressed. Once injury occurs, as early as six hours, this is just six hours later here, um, this distance increases. And of course, I think we all know it's a UMAP, it's not a linear distance, and we shouldn't overinterpret how far apart these grow. But um, it is, becomes very clear that there are distinct cell populations, very clearly demarcated. This is Surat clustering but also the visualization with UMAP shows it nicely. More of an inflammatory response, and then more of a developmental response. So these immune uh, endothelial cells, the subpopulation we think is the one that really drives the interferon production, massive cytokine release, and the developmental endothelial cells, they're still expressing these genes as if they're ready to regrow back, ready to regenerate, ready to develop. Um, at three days, which is when biologically we'd found the massive regeneration, that's when we see that a new cell population emerges, which has now a proliferative signature. It's um, mitosis, uh, nuclear division, chromosome segregation, and this is just here. All these UMAPs are just showing the different cell cycle genes that are activated in this pro proliferation. When we did monoclonal trajectory building, it was a little bit challenging because um, a lot of um, pseudotrying tra trajectories are developed are for developmental processes, which are more linear. Inflammation is a cyclical process because our cells get inflamed and then inflammation goes away. So it's sometimes better not to take the whole process, but instead take chunks of the, uh, of the process of injury and then just use that for pseudotime building. And what we found is that really these proliferative endothelial cells likely emerge from that developmental population that's been there all along, but apparently likely gets activated at this time frame here. Now, this is just simple um, you know, uh, observation that we had. We saw these different cell populations that emerged. But the question that we are most interested in is what drives uh, the shifts in the clusters? What drives the dynamics? 
And we realized, yes, we had picked a few transcription factors, mostly based on a biological hypothesis, but what if we had a more unbiased approach to understand the transcription factors driving injury, driving regeneration? And that led us into um, probably one of the most interesting new directions of our lab, which is really start developing a computational focus. And it is, um, we, we developed this algorithm, uh, BitFAM, which is a Bayesian inference of transcription factor activity in single cell data. It was again led by Shang. Um, and I'll just briefly walk you through this here. Um, and I think you, you'll see here that it, it reflects our biological bias. Um, we have this idea that when we try to analyze a single cell RNA sequencing data, is there prior biological knowledge that we could use to understand inferred transcription factor activities or how to analyze the data? And that prior knowledge here is in this ChIP-seq transcription factor target gene matrix. We went to a comprehensive ChIP-seq database and we said we know what target genes transcription factors have. We took the GTRD database here and we created this uh, matrix of whether or not a gene is a target gene of a transcription factor. This is just a normalized uh, single cell RNA sequencing data and we just hypothesized that there would be inferred transcription fact activities that we could learn using a machine learning approach with this as our input data, with the ChIP-seq data as our input data, and that this inferred transcription fact activity would, of course, drive the normalized RNA-seq, uh, single cell RNA-seq expression levels that we can measure, and that they're likely gene weights, because not every potential target gene in the ChIP-seq database is equally likely to be a target of a given transcription factor. So if we could use a machine learning approach to not only infer the activities, but also learn the weights, given this data here, that might be a very exciting way to uh, get a handle on the transcription factor activities and on the preferred targets of any given transcription factor. Now, what can we do with this data once we have this? Well, we could use the inferred activities to cluster cells. I know, you know, there's, um, for example, Surat is an excellent way to cluster cells, but what if you were interested not in all variable genes, but primarily in variable transcription fact activities? Would that give you another perspective on clustering cells? Would that have a different biological meaning? Could you use those inferred transcription factor activities to build trajectories? Because maybe transcription factors in a sort of hierarchical way, maybe they are more important for cell identity than just all variable genes, if you take you know, all 1,000, 2,000 variable genes in Surat clustering. And could you then also identify population-specific transcription factors? So this is just a key summary here. We take the GTRD database. This is the prior distributions in this Bayesian approach uh, of the weights. It's just based on whether or not uh, a transcription factor, a gene is a target in that database. The posterior distribution after the learning indicates the weight, how likely is this interaction of the inferred in interaction of a transcription factor and its target gene in the data set that you're analyzing. So that's different from that a priori, the prior distribution. Now, this is an important caveat, and, and I, I also really appreciate this at this meeting here where you know, everybody who presents their algorithm or their software package always points out the caveats. All of our approaches have caveats. Our prior distribution accuracy depends on the quality and the relevance of the ChIP-seq data set. And in our paper, we found that for some transcription factors, it might matter whether your input ChIP-seq data is derived from a relevant cell type. So for example, if you're studying immune cells in the lung, and your ChIP-seq data set is from, let's say, leukemic cell line. It might be much more relevant than if it were done on a glioma uh, uh, cell line from the brain. So for tr some transcription factors, it might impact your, the accuracy of your inference. And this is why I think one should always try to uh, put it into the biological context when you interpret the data uh, that uh, BitFem provides to you. Uh, and then we use r -STAN for the inference uh, as a machine learning approach. Now, Tableau Morris is, of course, something that we all use. This is uh, what we use to kind of benchmark and understand it. I think all of you are familiar, so I won't um, spend much time on this here, but it's a great way to start. And now, of course, there are, you know, there's human atlases and, and other atlases, too, that you can use now, too. But this is how it works. And I won't go into details of both packages today because Shang and Shinga are presenting both BitFem and TrendCatcher at the workshop at 3.30, so 
Uh, I'll just try to give you examples of how they helped us uh, give us some biological insights. So what does BitPEM generate? It generates a heat map of inferred transcription fact activities. The labels here are biological labels based on, you know, we're using that as a ground truth. So what are these cell types that are biologically labeled? Um, and what you can find here, so these are alveolar macrophages using traditional markers of alveolar macrophages. This is all the lung. So this is lung endothelial cells. This is B cells in the lung from the Tabula Morris database. And so this is the inferred activity of the transcription factor here. This is an example here, MAFB. I'm not sure if you can read it here, but MAFB. This is PAX5. This is TAL1. And when we first showed this to our colleagues, we had no idea what PAX5 was. Um, but you know, someone in the audience said, PAX5 is the uh, B cell transcription factor. It really determines fate of B cells. Uh, and it's nice for us because you know, we, we really came to this agnostically. And when we look at the same corresponding population here, you wouldn't find much PAX5 mRNA because transcription factors are lowly expressed. We all know the issues with sequencing depth, with single cell RNA sequencing, but based on a machine learning approach, its targets were apparently highly expressed in that population. So it gave us a handle on inferring PAX5 activity, even though you can hardly see any, um, you know, any expression of PAX5 itself here, as assessed by single cell RNA sequencing. Same with MAFB, it's a macrophage fate uh, transcription factor, and it's nicely expressed here, corresponding to the biological label, alveolar macrophages, that's the main macrophage in the lung. And again, we see it in other cell types, we, we just did not have a lot of luck. If we had just gone by mRNA levels, we would not have found it. TEL1, you, see, you do see it nicely here, it is expressed, but it's much more clearly and widely you see our learned, inferred transcription fact activities because its targets are so well expressed in this population, the lung endothelial population here. So this is the heat map that it generates, and you can have biological labels here. You can also use Surat labels or other labels here, but it gives you a very good handle on it, um, on, on what cell types express, or not express, what cell types have which inferred transcription fact activities. Now, it also then, and this is the important thing, it links the, this is the, the posterior distributions. After the learning process, it gives you weights for each transcription factors and their target genes here. And this is, I think, to me, was one of the most interesting findings. And as somebody who was biologist coming to computation biology, it really highlighted to me the value of doing this here. So when you look at the ChIP-seq database and you say, what are the ChIP-seq targets of TEL1? These are the processes you find here. So TEL1 is involved in RNA metabolic process, macromolecule modification, protein modification. PAX5. Metabolic process, metabolic process, macromolecule modification. Why is that? That's because what most transcription factors do is just keep cells going. It just, they help maintain cells. And it's important because if they stop doing that, we would all be dead right now, and we don't want to be dead. So we're happy that they do this, but it's not intellectually that exciting. It doesn't tell us much about heterogeneity because they do it in all the cells. Now, if you say, let's look at only the genes that are the top weighted targets from our learning approach, and not just all potential targets, it turns out that TEL1 has cell differentiation, circulatory system, cardiovascular system development, vascular development. So now it is enriched for genes that actually are much more matching the biological function of TEL1, which I thought was very exciting that we were able to pull that out. So instead of looking at all the targets, this told us much more about the actual function of TEL1 than looking at, you know, the whatever, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 potential targets in ChIP-seq. Same with PAX5. If you look at all potential PAX5 targets in ChIP-seq, it's the same thing, a lot of maintenance genes. You look at here, it's B-cell activation, leukocyte activation, leukocyte differentiation, lymphoid development. It tells you much more about what does PAX5 really do. So I think this was, again, something that, that helped validate in our mind the biological value of this approach here. Now, it comes to clustering. We did not originally intend it as a clustering algorithm, but we're really using it more as a validation. Do transcription factors, because we've heard some really, really great talks, for example, uh, one of the first talks by uh, um, Sandrine Dudois was a great introduction to the different ways how you can cluster cells. And, and I think it's important for us to realize that there are multiple clustering approaches, but they should be maybe guided in part by the biological questions. So could you cluster cells just by the inferred transcription fact activities? And what we find is 
Yes, you can. So the biological labeling here matches the clustering just based on transcription factor activities here. And it's comparable to if you were to use, for example, Surat, or if you were to combine it with other transcription factor inference algorithms like Scenic, of course, then combined with a clustering algorithm like Leuven. So yes, you can cluster it nicely. And in some cases, there's not much of a difference. In some cases, there is a difference. But again, I'm using this more as a way of validating the approach and not necessarily saying that one clustering approach is better than the other. I really think clustering should be contextual in what do you want the, to cluster the cells for. Now, going back to why we got into this here, we wanted to go back to lung injury. And I'll just show you one slide about these results here because that's what inspired us. And this is what we found here. So if we look at the cells um, after six hours of bacterial endotoxin injection, LPS injury here. Um, this is the, the genes that are activated, it's these immune genes. But instead of us now looking at the expression of transcription factors, which is what had led us to SOX17, and again, it was very hypothesis driven because we had known that SOX17 was important in regeneration and in suppression inflammation. This is what it told us here. These are the um, UMAPs of the inferred activities and this is what we found, autoimmune regulator, vitamin D receptor, um, not necessarily things that we would have um, stumbled upon just by hypothesis-driven research. You know, vitamin D receptor, this is right now the, the sunniest and hottest Seattle I've ever seen in my life, but it means we have a lot of vitamin D, and it is important in immune cell regulation, but it's not something that, that we would have nat naturally gravitated towards. Again, interferon regulatory factor, very important in inflammation, inflammatory responses, so, and PPAR gamma is something that it's, there are a lot of ways to therapeutically intervene here. So it has really opened up many more directions for us to do our research by looking at inferred activities instead of expression levels of transcription factors. So um, just because we, we lost a bit of time on the technical difficulties, I won't go into a lot of details here. So this is just a summary of it. It's on GitHub. And um, you know, we are also interested here, I'll just briefly touch on this here, that, we, you know, what I felt our main contribution here is that we really try to integrate prior knowledge, prior biological knowledge, empirically derived from ChIP-seq, but maybe there are other ways to also integrate additional knowledge. For example, what about uh, intersecting our data, ChIP-seq data, with ATAC-seq data, so that we further filter down the potential targets to those where the chromatin regions are accessible. So there's more ways to, I think, build on BitFam, and we hope that future iterations either by us or by others, could, could work on that and, and do this even better. But I want to now touch on a, a second question, which is um, COVID-19 and the platform Trend Catcher that, were, that was developed by Xinga Wang, also a PhD student in the lab. And just for time reasons, I'm going to not go into too much detail here because, again, Xinga is actually doing a live coding session and demonstration uh, this uh, afternoon at 3.30. But it can be used for bulk and for single cell RNA-seq, single cell RNA-seq requires that we pseudo bulk the samples. So it works best if you have a fairly stable cell population, such as, for example, PBMCs, where you know that these are lymphocytes or these are CD4, CD8 cells. So it's easiest to pseudo bulk those. If you're dealing with situations where new subpopulations emerge, pseudo bulking can be a bit challenging. But um, if you're working with, uh, with samples where you can confidently pseudo bulk or you just do bulk RNA-seq, um, what does trend catcher do? It uses a curve fitting approach. It models the trajectory of your dynamic genes and then calculates a gene-wise dynamic p-value. And so you identify which genes are dynamic, looking at the whole trajectory, looking at the whole trajectory, it gives you the trajectory patterns. And something that I'll highlight here really is to um, also look at the time heat map and I will emphasize COVID-19 because in COVID-19 we found it is so essential to look at the dynamics of gene expression and not just which genes are dynamic overall. And I'll walk you through that here. So using simulated data, Shinga compared trend catcher to um, you know, impulse DE, DE-seq2, DE-seq2 spline. We use a, a spline approach when we uh, do our curve fitting. That's why. And we do fairly well when it comes to um, uh, just comparing our accuracy. Now, what helps here is the more time points you have, the better trend catcher performs compared to other approaches. 
and the more complex the trajectory is. If you have a biphasic trajectory, a lot of the other approaches, so biphasic means up and then down. That's a fairly, it's, it's something where I don't think trend catcher um, is that much better than others. But if you have a multimodal trajectory, um, it does much better. And so I think that those are reasons to, to choose the package you use to analyze your longitudinal uh, time course data is based on the complexity and the number of time points. So the more time points you have and the more complex the trajectory, I think the better trend catcher performs. And this is just an example of the various uh, data sets that we looked at in our paper. This is the JCI Insight paper. Um, this is early in the pandemic. This is um, in non-human primates, PBMCs, uh, single cell data of uh, human patients with uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, um, bulk whole blood data, um, and then other uh, PBMC data too. So I'll just show you first the non-human primate data here. And this just gives you, this is what Trend Catcher gives you. It tells you which genes are upregulated over the whole dynamic time course, which genes are downregulated. And I think, um, for me, one of the important things is how do we communicate these results to biologists? Um, as you know that, you know, we can always do gene set enrichment analysis. We can tell our colleagues these are genes that are uh, dynamic or th that are different. But I think what's really key is to look at when are they peaking? which genes are early peaking, which genes are late peaking, and what this time heat map does, it shows you um, this is the mean fold of the genes in that given pathway that is statistically significant. And this also tells you then here what percentage of the geo pathway is dynamic and what are the numbers of the genes. So you can immediately see there's a 2.61 log two fold increase in the mean, um, mean expression of this pathway, genes in virus defense response, and then it gradually wanes. So it goes down, so this is always versus the prior time points, so zero day to one day, one day to two day, two day to four day. So it gives you a very nice sense of there's an immediate peak up and then a gradual going down here. And it, this became really important for us and it had actually a lot of translation relevance when we looked at whole blood RNA-seq in patients who developed severe COVID-19. What we found is that they had a massive increase in their immune activation here in the beginning and a very gradual decrease. And this is here, the individual trajectories here. So in severe, you see the, the red here is the severe patients, green is, or, sorry, blue is moderate patients, green is mild patients. Neutrophils are the immune cell types that are actually meant to fight off bacteria, but they get activated even in a viral infection. Patients who had mild COVID-19, their green is more or less flat. There's virtually no significant mean change in gene expression of neutrophil activation genes in whole blood. Those who had severe COVID-19, so these samples were all taken at a time when you didn't know whether they developed severe, mild, or moderate COVID-19. This was early on. They all had similar symptoms right after they were, they were diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2. But those who early on in the first week already had an upwards trajectory of activating the neutrophils, and this is what uh, you know, Trend Catcher really nicely identifies, they're the ones where the neutrophils stayed active. You can no longer find virus at week two, but the neutrophils remain active. And we suspect that these patients who develop severe COVID-19 they might also be very important for what's called long COVID now. So long COVID is that you have a hyperactive immune system long after um, the virus is not being actively transcribed. You might still have viral antigens, but you're no longer contagious, and yet your neutrophils remain activated. So this is just an example of how understanding the time course can have immense benefits for analyzing the data. Um, I'll just, um, I know because we're running out of time, and I think there's a awards ceremony very soon, so I don't want to take time there. But um, the other thing is that COVID-19 is not only about, severe COVID-19 is not only about having hyperactive immune system, it is also about having inadequate activation of the right immune cells. So neutrophils are the cell types that are hyperactive in severe COVID-19, and they're hyperactive early on, and they stay high. So coming back to this here, so this here. They, they are active here and then they remain high. But the actual 
immune cell type that needs to be activated and the actual immune signaling pathway that needs to be activated is type 1 interferon signaling. So that's the pathway that helps eliminate the virus early on. So the patients who have only moderate COVID-19, who go on to develop moderate COVID-19, they have a very rapid response of other cell types, not the neutrophils, natural killer cells, monocytes, B cells, T cells off the interferon pathway, and then it subsides. The severe, the patients who develop severe COVID-19 have a suppressed response here. So when you follow this time course, you see that the best way to, for the immune system to avoid severe COVID-19 is rapidly activate interferon 1, eliminate the virus, and avoid having your neutrophils coming in and causing more damage than good because they are not the cells that your immune system really needs to activate. So again, this is something just for, for time reasons, I'm not gonna go into this. Um, if you have questions about Trendcatcher or BitFam, uh, Shang and Shinga will gladly uh, answer them in the workshop. Um, but it's, it's, I think COVID-19 is just one example. I would love to see this applied also in, for example, Alzheimer's disease or other, not just these acute and subacute diseases, but also chronic diseases where we're going to get more and more longitudinal bulk and single cell uh, transcriptomic data. Let us look at the temporal trajectories of these different diseases and severities, but also for biological processes. When your cells are developing, embryonic development, what are the bursts of certain uh, pathways? And if you combine trend catcher with BitFam, what are the bursts of certain transcription fact activities that are turned on and then off again at defined stages of development? Now, um, just as in the last few minutes, I want to touch on something very simple which we're just now playing with, experimenting, I just wanted to throw this out there, is that we want to look at now dynamic changes with single cell ATAC-seq data. And um, the first challenge that we had uh, is how do we even represent single cell ATAC-seq data so that we can discover new aspects of it? So I'm not gonna show you any real results, but just share some thoughts on you how we're even starting to approach this problem right now. So a lot of you probably who work with single cell ATAC-seq data use the peak by cell matrix. You, you look at all the different peaks that you have in your single cell data, and then you generate the, a matrix for each individual cell here. Now, that's one way to do it, um, but this is something else that both Shang and Xing are right now working on. What if we, and this is maybe touching on our kind of prior knowledge approach, what if we annotated the cell matrix based on what we know about the genome structure? What if we separated intergenic regions from exon one, exon two, exon three, intron one, intron two, intron three, promoter region. Um, would that be something that might be of value so that we don't just look at accessible and non-accessible regions, but we ask this question, accessible where? And what would that tell us? So just coming up with this idea of how to represent the matrix, I think is something that's where we are right now. And then now we're thinking about what can we do with this here? And this is just to give you an example. This is the same gene, HES1, very important gene in the developing mouse and embryonic brain. This is single cell ATAX data from the 10X website here. HES1 is this, this gene, it's part of the notch pathway, it helps drive differentiation. This is the peak matrix, and of course, uh, for the same gene, transcription start, start site, um, it, it's, it doesn't have that resolution because it doesn't tell you where is the chromatin accessible. If you now a look at exon, intron, it gives you much better resolution, and then you can cluster the cells um, or sort the cells. This is right now just sorting the cells by where is the accessibility taking place. And we could do the same thing for the intergenic regions. We could look at, for example, define certain enhancers, certain epigenetic modification sites. If we could break up the sites, maybe that would be a different approach to looking at single cell ATAC seq data than the peak matrix. So, um, again, this is just in, in different examples of genes where we're just looking at this right now, and we want to now use this here, this approach now to, to maybe uh, use um, new machine learning or deep learning approaches to learn identities of cells with this better resolution and this new approach of how to uh, represent the data, the single cell ataxic data. So this is our phase two. Can we identify cell heterogeneity with this annotated gene segment matrix? It's where we annotate coding and non-coding regions. Do we think that this annotation approach helps us identify distinct cell types so that we don't just have this binary approach, accessible, not accessible, but accessible where? Will this help us maybe track real-time changes or pseudotime changes um, as disease progress? Because uh, if we want to create something like uh, chromatin accessibility velocity idea or different changes in state, would this be helpful? And then um, 
can the genomic distance between accessible uh, segments across all the genome help define cell states? Are there certain genes that co become co-accessible or not? So these are ongoing projects here. Um, and again, I'll just um, uh, take a few questions there. At the end, this is just the work which is done. Um, you know, Shang and Xing have been really driving this with collaborators Yang Dai and Lucy Zhang at Pittsburgh. This is the Bioconductor Workshop by Xing and Shang today at 3.30 uh, p.m. at uh, the GMB building. And um, one last thing I want to just plug is, you know, I just became the department head, and one of the biggest mandates I have is to really expand our genomics and computational biology section. So we are very actively recruiting, of course, graduate students um, for a new genomics and computational cell biology track in our program that we just created. Uh, postdoctoral fellows and senior data scientists, but we also have several tenure track positions in genomics and computational biology. So if you're interested, please email me for any of these positions here. I'll still be here tomorrow and I will gladly talk to you. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Um, I guess we'll have time for a few questions. I know we're running late, but I know everybody's got some that are interesting. That was a wonderful talk, Dr. Rimman. Uh, incredibly clear. Towards the end, you got kind of closer to the frontier, though, in terms of representing accessibility um, in different ways in different cells. Uh, we struggled a bit with this. Uh, yesterday, Wanson Liu from um, Mike Love's lab uh, presented in a workshop ways to test out representations of it. And I'm sure you know that the Greenleaf Lab and uh, Jeff Granja has, have also addressed this. What do you see happening with this as people are moving towards multi-ohm, for example, um, and on the research side, but also in terms of simplifying it so that it's more clinically actionable, cheaper, faster, strike a balance between good data and useful data, or a, um, lots of data and useful data? Um, where, where do you see this going? So, so I think I'll, I'll talk on the research side first, um, because as of three weeks ago, I don't see patients anymore. So, um, but. Um, the, the, the research side is fascinating for me because I think the multi-ohm is what really helps us um, anchor, because we are trying to understand um, cell state shifts over time. And we would like to track in that same cell, especially like in, in a multi-ohm, uh, use the RNA-seq data to, to label sort of the biological function of the cell and then understand changes in the ATAC-seq with the different representation approaches. So we feel that um, we would love to benchmark our approaches and our learning off the cell identity using the multi ohm approaches. So I think that will be fantastic. Right now, there's so much um, of the multi ohm is limited to PBMCs, and there's not that much available for other cell types that we'd be very interested in studying. So I hope that there's more multi ohm mixed data available. And like you said, we're obviously not the first lab that's doing, there's many other labs that are more advanced in terms of trying to how to represent it. But I do think that where I see this field going is to improve the resolution of how we represent the single cell ATAC-seq data, and I'm especially interested in the intergenic regions. So in, in some really um, very early pilot approaches when we try to identify cells um, you know, using a single cell ATAC-seq atlas, and then um, trying to say, and like just inferred gene activity scores, what is the cell type? We asked this question, what if we only looked at the intergenic region? Would that be sufficient? And there's some very early data that suggests that maybe the non-coding regions might be actually sufficient to identify a cell, and it's not just the coding region. So those are, that's where I see the field going. Uh, for the clinical question, again, I just think that there's such a disconnect. We, we need so much more work done to understand the data. I, I just personally, I would love to say that we're very close to interpreting single cell RNA-seq, RNA-seq data for patients, but I just don't see that right now. I think we need so much more work on the computational end to, to really meaningfully interpret the data. Thank you so much. Okay, now we'll do one online question. Um, this is from Ian Smith, who said, very interesting transcription factor model. So the question, do you expect the inferred uh, TF gene weights to be time dependent, uh, for example, due to change in chromatin state, and can the model account for this? And a follow up, and how can the inferred uh, TF gene weights be validated? Yes. So, so I think, uh, first of all, I do think that there's a um, possibility for the weights to be time dependent. And um, I do think that intersecting it with single cell ATAC seq data, for example, if we had multi ohm data, um, that would be a, a fascinating approach to ask this question. 
the weights would be much more accurate if we could filter down for actually accessible genes. I think we would have much higher accuracy. And I do think that multium data would be very useful and it needs to be integrated into our BitFem model, which currently allows for integrating it, but it's, it's not something that we routinely build in. So this is something I would like to see that built in into the future. And I think the second question was, how do we validate it? So as you all know, ground truth is always the biggest challenge that we face. And uh, what we did for this paper um, is that we used um, um, like a, a CRISPR-Cas9 deletion of multiple transcription factors, and we tested would our inferred activities go down following deletion. And of course, the, more, the better we get at uh, deleting, the better our deletion efficiencies get, the more data sets we have with targeted transcription factor uh, Cas9 deletions, CRISPR-Cas9 deletions, I think the better validation we will have. Uh, but we did see uh, that our model was partially validated with that approach, and I'd like to just have more data sets available with, with transcription factor activity, uh, transcription factor targeting to further validate it. So, thanks. Thank you. Dan, Dr. Wong. Okay, so we're going to cross our fingers. We're going to close this WebEx. We're going to immediately open the other one, which actually may already be open for the awards. So we'll see you in just a minute or two.